This is a mechanism of disease map for abdominal compartment syndrome. I'll be talking about the etiology, the pathophysiology, and the manifestations for abdominal compartment syndrome. As in all of these flowcharts, each of the boxes is color-coded according to this legend that you see in the top right here, and I'll be clearing each of these boxes and talking through each of them one by one as we repopulate the flowchart. Let's go ahead and get started. Let's start with the central pathophysiology of abdominal compartment syndrome. That is, you have increased intra-abdominal pressure. I've abbreviated that to IAP for the rest of this flowchart. Now, a normal intra-abdominal pressure, a normal IAP, is below 12 millimeters of mercury. The increased intra-abdominal pressure happens when it's above 15 to 20 millimeters of mercury. And that's when you'll start to see symptoms, that's when you'll start to see organ dysfunction and organ failure. And the intra-abdominal pressure affects many of the organ systems that pass through or pass nearby the intra-abdominal space. And we'll talk about those and their respective manifestations in just a second. First, let's talk about the etiology of abdominal compartment syndrome, how exactly that intra-abdominal pressure gets so high, and there are a few ways that this can happen. We could break it down into four buckets here. You can have decreased abdominal wall compliance. This is a structural problem. The abdominal wall is supposed to be compliant and bend so much as the pressure in the intra-abdominal space increases. And there's only so much that it will bend. There's only so much it can flex. So when there's something restricting the abdominal wall from bending, that can increase your intra-abdominal pressure. Visceral edema, or swelling of the organs inside your abdomen, can of course increase your intra-abdominal pressure. Increased luminal contents, such as um, your, your bowel movement contents, can increase your intra-abdominal pressure as well. And increased contents in the rest of the intra-abdominal space. This, is, um, this could be many things. This can be your bladder, this could be your blood, this could be swelling from another organ, this could be bleeding in from a blood vessel. There are many things that are in your uh, intra-abdominal space, and if that stuff takes up more place, you'll have increased pressure in the intra-abdominal space. Let's look into more detail as to the etiologies. There are a few things that might decrease your abdominal wall compliance. Abdominal or pelvic trauma can make your abdomen less pliable. You can, for instance, have scar tissue that prevents your abdomen from bending or being as pliable as it used to be. Abdominal surgery might do this as well. Again, a lot of scar tissue, a lot of um, messing with the, uh, the layers of the abdominal wall makes it less resistant than usual. Prone positioning can do this as well. You might be prone positioned for a procedure or a surgery, such as if you have a back surgery, and that can prevent your abdomen from bending outwards if you're laying stomach down on a bed. Mechanical ventilation, of course, is positive pressure ventilation. So if you're putting in positive pressure into your lungs, that's not normally how you breathe. You normally breathe by expanding your chest wall and increasing that space in your body. But if you have mechanical ventilation and you're forcing air down into that area, that can decrease your abdominal wall compliance as well. Morbid obesity can do it too. The more layers of fat you have on a person, the harder it is to be, is it's, it's going to be to raise that fat, to increase the volume of your abdomen. So morbid obesity can cause it too. Major burns as well can cause edema and decreased abdominal wall compliance. Again, scarred tissue from the burns, inflamed tissue from the burns is not going to bend quite as easy as like natural collagen, as your natural abdominal wall. Next, visceral edema. There's a lot of things that can cause swelling in the abdomen. Sepsis is one of them that can cause swelling of the internal organs. You can also get visceral edema from massive volume resuscitation when you're giving somebody a lot of volume into their IV for any given reason. And there are a few reasons you might do this. In the case of major burns, you get a lot of insensible losses through burns. You become very dehydrated through your burns. So that might be a, a reason that you give somebody a lot of volume, a lot of IV fluids, and that can lead to visceral edema which can lead to abdominal compartment syndrome. Post, uh, post-operative or intraoperative course for a standard patient might result in this as well. During surgeries, you do get a lot of fluid, especially if you have a lot of blood loss, and that can also lead to visceral edema, leading to abdominal compartment syndrome. And hypovolemic shock, of course. If a patient comes in very dehydrated, they have very low intravascular volume, that might lead you to do some pretty massive volume resuscitation, leading to visceral edema and possibly abdominal compartment syndrome. Next big category is increased in luminal contents. 
You can get this from gastroparesis. That's when your stomach is no longer pumping forward as it should. Your stomach is essentially paralyzed and food starts to back up. That would be one reason that your stomach contents increase more than usual. Paralytic ileus is kind of the same thing. You have uh, kind of a paralysis of your small intestine and your bowel contents again back up in there as well. Mechanical bowel obstruction does the exact same thing. If there's something blocking the stool or the bowel contents from moving forward, stuff is gonna back up behind it and that's gonna increase your intra-abdominal pressure. Now the colors here are kind of rainbow because there's a lot of things that can cause this. You can get gastroparesis and paralytic ileus from a surgery, for instance. So iatrogenic is covered. You can get it from a neurological pathology, like in diabetic neuropathies, that can lead to a gastroparesis. You can also have inflammatory disorders that prevent your bowel movements from doing the normal peristalsis that pushes things forward. But in any case, increasing your luminal contents through gastroparesis, paralytic ileus, and mechanical bowel obstruction can increase your intra-abdominal pressure. Last category, increasing of any other contents inside the abdomen. Now there's a lot that could happen here. You could have acute pancreatitis where the pancreas is swollen and you have saponification and there's all kinds of inflammation inside your gut. That'll definitely take, take up some space. You can have an intra-abdominal tumor or abscess. This of course takes up more space as the tumor grows or as the abscess grows and this can be an infectious process of course. Massive ascites, such as in the case of cirrhosis or liver failure, can increase your intra-abdominal contents. Bleeding into your peritoneum or air inside the peritoneum. There's a couple things that might cause air in the peritoneum. You can have a uh, laceration of the bowel, for instance, can get air in there. You can have a uh, gallbladder infection that produces air. Bleeding into the peritoneum, similar, many things that can cause this. It could be trauma, it could be a bowel bleed, um, but in any case, blood or air inside your peritoneum should not be there and can increase the content volume and can therefore increase the pressure. Peritoneal dialysis, a lot of patients with um, kidney failure end up getting dialysis through the peritoneal space and you're kind of putting in fluids in and out of that peritoneal space so that can increase the volume of the contents and status post organ transplant as well as that new organ is going to have a lot of inflammation and you might have a third kidney um, because when they replace your kidney they don't necessarily take your failed kidneys out. They usually just leave them in there. So that can also increase your intra-abdominal contents. In any case, all of these etiologies lead to one thing, increased intra-abdominal pressure with an IAP, intra-abdominal pressure greater than 15 to 20 millimeters of mercury. Now we'll see how this affects the many organ systems and how that manifests in many different ways. First, the intra-abdominal pressure itself can cause a tight distended abdomen on physical exam. This can make the patient very uncomfortable too. They can have nausea and vomiting as well. Next, let's see how it affects the pulmonary system. If you have so much pressure in your abdomen, it's going to elevate your diaphragm. Remember your diaphragm is the muscle that kind of separates your chest and your abdominal cavities. So when you elevate the diaphragm, you're gonna impair your ventilation and you're gonna have increased intrathoracic pressure as well. So now you're seeing how that high abdominal pressure is causing a high intrathoracic pressure because that dividing muscle, the diaphragm, is elevated. This intrathoracic pressure will cause a decrease in pulmonary volume. Your lungs don't have enough space to expand, and you'll also have increased peak airway pressures as well. This can result in tachypnea and wheezing on the patient's side. So it'll manifest as shortness of breath, tachypnea, and wheezing. Next, the cardiac system. Increased intra-abdominal pressure can lead to compression of the inferior vena cava, which of course is a vein and is more squishy than the arterial system. This results in decreased venous return to the heart, which is a problem because it can decrease your cardiac output. And you can also increase your central venous pressure. So you'll see some symptoms um, in your lower extremities. We'll get to these in a second. You'll have lower extremity edema as you have increased central venous pressure. And the decreased cardiac output leads to hypotension because you're not pumping as much blood forward and also tachycardia as your body starts to tries to compensate for that decreased cardiac output. Another factor that contributes to the decreased cardiac output is the elevation of the diaphragm. If the diaphragm is higher up, the heart is not able to expand during diastole quite as much as it usually does, and that can also lead to decreased cardiac output. Next organ system is the kidneys. You'll have impaired venous drainage of the kidneys due to the increased intra-abdominal pressure, and the decreased cardiac output will also activate your renin, angiotensin, aldosterone system. The RAS system, renin, angiotensin, aldosterone system, leads to renal vasoconstriction, which will further impair 
the venous drainage from the kidneys and result in a decreased glomerular filtration rate and a decreased urine output. This can lead to progressive kidney failure as well as low or no urine, oligouria or anuria in very severe cases. And you can track the creatinines and the BUNs to see if the patient's kidneys are functioning as before or if they're getting worse. The next organ system that's affected is the GI tract, the gastrointestinal system. That increased intra-abdominal pressure can cause compression of the GI veins. Remember that these veins are the ones that take all the nutrients and um, blood from your gut, which contains the food that you just ate, and brings it all to the liver where they undergo detoxification before dumping all of that blood back into your main circulation. So if you have compression of those GI veins, you're going to have blood backing up into your gut, into your gut mucosa. So you'll have mucosal edema. This is worsened by the low cardiac output yet again. If you have low cardiac output, you have less blood going to your gut to begin with. You have intestinal hypoperfusion. And these two together put you at risk for intestinal ischemia. You're getting low blood going to your gut to begin with, and you're also having compression of the GI veins, compressing that venous outflow from the gut. So it makes it likely that the intestines are gonna have low blood content, low new fresh blood, low oxygen, and that can lead to intestinal ischemia, which can lead to mucosal injury, and that predisposes you to bacteria getting in through your GI tract, causing a bacteremia, which can lead to sepsis. And um, that's kind of the pathophysiology there. You're essentially blocking blood from leaving the gut and also blocking blood from getting into the gut with intestinal hypoperfusion. Last organ system to be affected is the central nervous system. You'll have increased intracranial pressure from the abdominal pressure. Remember that your intracranial pressure is connected to the abdominal space, not directly, but it goes very next to the abdominal space through the spinal canal. And as you compress that space, you can also increase your intracranial pressure from the increased intra-abdominal pressure. This results in many symptoms. You can have a positional headache, you can have confusion, you can have altered mental status and papilledema on eye exam. You can also have Cushing's triad, which results in some vital sign abnormalities. You can have bradycardia, you can have a widened pulse pressure, that's the difference between your systolic and diastolic pressure, as well as irregular breathing, Kussmaul respirations. So um, the central nervous system, of course, is one of the scarier outcomes of this. If you have any of these, um, it's, it is quite, quite concerning. Lastly, a few notes on some tests and uh, labs that you can do to help um, diagnose abdominal compartment syndrome. The gold standard test is actually a urinary bladder pressure measurement. Now, this is an indirect measurement of your intra-abdominal pressure. So it's not exactly measuring your intra-abdominal pressure, but of course, your bladder and your intra-abdominal space are um, almost continuous. There's a very pliable bladder wall between them. So measuring your bladder pressure is very similar to measuring your intra-abdominal pressure, and that can give you a good idea of where you are and if you have abdominal compartment syndrome. Next, almost all these patients get a CT scan. There are some classic signs of abdominal compartment syndrome on CT scan. This includes the elevated diaphragm that we mentioned, an increased abdominal diameter, larger than what you would expect it to be, compression of the inferior vena cava, which we mentioned when we talked about the cardiac outcomes, and intestinal wall thickening. That would be the mucosal edema and potentially mucosal injury as well. So you'll see a lot of these pathophysiologic outcomes on the CT scan, and it's worth doing that to help you diagnose abdominal compartment syndrome. That's it for this flowchart. I hope this was helpful, and be sure to check out the other compartment syndrome video on acute compartment syndrome in the limbs and extremities. Thank you for listening.